Hey there, you're listening to the Girls Talking Life podcast, and I'm your host, Johanna. If you're like me, you love time with friends. I always leave feeling encouraged, inspired to try something different, or I've learned something new. So why not continue to grow even when we can't be with our girlfriends? We're not made to do life on our own. So in each episode of this show, I'll bring you a girl and her story to give you refreshing ideas to stir your soul. Let's walk this road together. Are you ready to talk life? Welcome to the show. I'm so glad you chose to spend some time here. Our summer break is wrapping up this week. My girls start school on Thursday and I can't even believe it. I am so excited to be back here with you though, bringing you a new conversation with my friend of a friend, Desiree Kaluza. What a great name. I didn't tell her this while we were chatting, but Desiree was usually the name I picked for myself when I would play as a little girl. My maiden name is Doke, so I was always Desiree Doke, spoken in a very sophisticated and mysterious voice. If this is your first time listening, or if you've been enjoying Girls Talking Life for a while now, be sure to subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts, and then every other Monday, When a new episode is released, it automatically updates for you, and you don't have to go looking for it. As I mentioned, my guest today is Desiree Kaluza. Desiree was born and raised in Southern California, but she came to Ohio for college, and she has never left. She is an associate pastor and a children's pastor at New Start Church, where she's been working for the past 18 years. In our conversation today, Desiree and I talk about what led her to children's ministry. She tells us the wild story of how she ended up as a legal guardian to two teenagers when their father passed away, and how it was an answer to prayer in the most interesting way. At the end of the show, we also talk about contentment and singleness, and how Desiree experienced a time of grief where she asked questions like, why isn't God answering my prayers? What am I doing wrong? And she explains how time and maturity have allowed her to find joy and beauty in singleness, while still having the desire for marriage and a family of her own. I loved getting to chat with Desiree. Her story is fascinating, and I know you're going to like it too. Here's my conversation with Desiree. Hi, Desiree. Thanks so much for being on Girls Talking Life. Thank you so much for having me. This is exciting. I'm really excited. I know you because we have a mutual friend, but I don't really know you all that well. Right, right. So um, can you just introduce yourself and tell me a little bit about what you do? Sure. So my name is Desiree Kaluza. I, am, I live right here in Powell. I was born and raised in Southern California, but have lived now longer in Ohio, so I'm officially a Buckeye, (laughs) but I am single. I don't have any children of my own. I've never been married, and I am currently on staff at a church in Delaware, Ohio at New Start Church, and I've been there now for, gosh, it's going on my 18th year, so... My last year of college, I went to Mount Vernon Nazarene University, started working at my current church in 2002, and I've been there ever since. So, How did you go from Southern California to Ohio? So I am the oldest of four children, and for my parents, this was kind of their trial run of how do we get a kid from high school to college? (laughs) We did all of the, you know, college applications and trying to figure out you know, just the options of where I wanted to go. So the interesting thing about about my college career is I was raised in a very loving, supportive Christian home. And when I left for college, I had not made that personal decision for myself in my faith. But one of the things that I remember thinking as a 17-year-old, 18-year-old, I remember thinking, well, I want to go to a Christian school. I mean, it has to be a good environment. So I want to be a good person. And I believed in God and was a part of youth group and went to church my entire life and and had that blessing, but I hadn't made that personal decision. And it actually, through my college career, was where I came face to face with Christ and actually accepted him on my own and made that personal decision. So my parents found Mount Vernon Nazarene University through Focus on the Family. Mm -hmm. And it was one of several colleges that we were looking at. And I want, I knew I wanted to go away out of state just because I could. My parents said, just try it for a year. If you like it, you know, you can continue, but you always have a place to come home to try it for a year. I committed to them. I said, I'm going to try this for a year. If I hate it, I will come home. And that's kind of how it all started. 
So I left for college in 97. And besides coming back home to California to my parents' house for, you know, spring break or Christmas break or summer breaks, when I left home at 18 years old, I I never really went back. So um, it was one of those journeys. What a great place to have to go back to. I know. It is nice. It's nice to visit. But I love, 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 love living in Ohio. So college brought you here and you decided to stay. It did. Yes. You accepted Jesus there. Yes. And did you also decide you wanted to go into ministry there? That's interesting too. I always assumed that I would be a teacher. I always wanted my own classroom. I went into the education program at Mount Vernon and long, long story short, the year that I had to declare a major was super difficult because I couldn't actually get into the education program at the time. I had to take a test and I would miss it by, you know, two or three points. And I took the test as many times as you were allowed to take the test. And so it was my junior year and my advisor at the time was phenomenal. And um, he said, all right, come to my office every day. Uh, we had a J term time period between semesters. So the month of January. And he said, come to my office every day during J term. We're going to pray and ask God what he wants you to do with your life. Cause I had to declare a major. I couldn't declare education. I had no idea what I was going to do. I knew I wanted to work with kids. So went to his office every morning. He prayed with me and over me and we prayed together. And then uh, at the time they had a major for Christian education And he said, what about Christian education? I said, I have no idea what that means. (laughs) I said, is that working in a Christian school? What is that? You know, what does that mean? So he said, I could apply to a very, various things. Um, Children's ministry is one of them. And I thought, okay, well, I love children. I love the church. I love Jesus. (laughs) So maybe that's the answer. So I, I declared Christian education as my major. So I met my pastor right when he and his family were, was starting a new start through a mutual friend. And Greg, our pastor, said uh, to another friend of mine, do you know any college students that, would, that we can hire part-time, like part, part, part-time to do children's ministry? And so I was introduced to him, and that's how it all started. So 2001 is when I officially started, helped start the church from nothing. It was a, a, a new church plant. And uh, here we are 18 years later. Wow. Yeah. So that advisor and that prayer really helps put you in the place oh, along. Yes, definitely. You know, and it's funny because I'm sure we all have done this. You know, you look back and you see the obvious steps and all of the details that God unfolds in your life. When you're living in the middle of it, it's not always clear. So when people ask me, you know, how did you get to be a pastor? How did you get called into ministry? How did you find that journey where you knew that's where God wanted you? How did it, how did it settle with you when you weren't the, you know, third grade teacher or the second grade teacher that you thought you would be? So I look back and I think, well, it's, it was all part of the plan. It just was in the middle of it. You just can't see it as clearly. So it's super interesting and, and amazing to see all of that and how he unfolds all of those details. And have you had those thoughts? You know, I should have been that third grade teacher. Uh, you know what, what's super, super cool about it all is I really haven't. I've been a a pastor now for 18 years and every year it just is more affirming and more solidifying that this is what God has, has me doing and where he wants me to be. And it's super fulfilling personally and professionally. So it's been, it's been nice not to have that part of my life as the, what if this, or what if that, you know? That's so good. Yeah. Yeah. So what does your job look like now? So I oversee, it's kind of twofold. It kind of has morphed into two, two jobs, probably for the first, the first 10 years, 10 to 12 years was specifically just children's ministry. So I oversaw, led and directed everything that had to do with fifth graders and younger, also connecting with the whole family and and leading that area of the church. Over the last six years, seven years or so, I've I've taken on a a different leadership role. And so my actual title now is I'm the associate pastor as well as the children's pastor at our church. So I do a lot of kind of overall church ministry, working with adults, working with ministry leaders, working with our staff. 
And I don't know what the statistics are, but to be uh-huh. at one church for 18 years, is yes. that kind of unusual? That's very unusual. <laughs> very, very unusual. And it is a huge, huge blessing. And I actually was just talking to, to Greg, our pastor, um, just last week because our church went through this huge, very unique situation of not only did we move facilities and actually move from Powell to Delaware, but we actually adopted and brought into our, our church uh, family, another church. Oh, wow. So we, um, moved into their current facility and then adopted their church congregation into new start. And so we merged two churches, which is a super unique, interesting, beautiful, difficult. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yes. Yes. So, but yeah, as far as being at one church for the length that I've been there is very unique and special and very unheard of. And it is, it's one of those things that I've always said, okay, am I just comfortable because I've, I've known this role for so long and I know the people I work with and I, and I kind of have the groove and I've got my niche and, um, I never want to just assume because of being comfortable that this is where I'm supposed to be, you know, where just in life, I think we do that a lot too of, well, this is what I know. So this is what I should be doing. And so it's easy. Yeah. But I mean, it just, every year it's affirming. I've, I've gone on various interviews for other churches and other states or, you know, close in the area and have really explored, okay, God, you need to really guide me on this. Am I, am I here because you want me here? And I get the beauty of knowing the ropes and being here for 18 years and building relationships with people and that longevity, or are you wanting me to now take a new path and a new journey of my life? And it really has been, he has me here for, for the long haul, 18 years. And I can legitimately say, I could see myself doing this for another 18, 20 years at New Start. Yeah. You know, it would be, have to be a pretty big crystal clear kind of move for God to say, okay, now it's time to try a different area or a different church family or, you know, completely different job type of thing. Well, you did have a big transition come into your life several years ago. I did. Yes. Uh, you became the guardian to some kids, I believe that were part of your church family. Correct. Can yes. you just talk to us about how that all transpired? Sure. Sure. So that, um, that was a very, very interesting part of my adult life. So I'll give you a little bit of a background. Uh, the Demian family, uh, I met Randy. He was a single dad that came to our church when we were in Powell. He walked in. I remember the first Sunday he walked in. Um, his sister was actually with him visiting from North Carolina. So I thought I had never met the family. So I thought his sister was actually his wife. Mm-hmm. Um, so they walk in. They have two kids. Sam at the time was, uh, I believe, in kindergarten. And Lexi at the time was um, in second grade. So they walk in and meet this family, meet the kids, quickly find out that, the, that Pam was not his, his wife, but his sister. So I remember that first Sunday and they literally, Randy and Sam and Lexi stayed at New Star and became just a huge part of the church. So their entire family, Randy, Lexi, and Sam were part of our church. The kids grew up in children's ministry under my direct leadership, youth group with our youth pastor. I mean, just was one of those families that everyone knew was fully involved in the life of the church. And they went through a rough, a rough time where um, his ex-wife, their mom, uh, went through just um, a lifetime of addiction and kids went through some pretty difficult, just kind of back and forth between mom and dad's house and and dealing with all of that as children. And so at the time, kind of fast forward, by the time Sam got to sixth grade and Lexi was moving into her front year of high school, their mom passed away due to just the lifestyle that she had been living for a majority of their life. And, um, you know, Randy came to me and I remember he called me. I was at church getting ready for, it was in the fall. I was getting ready for a a fall trunk or treat event for children's ministry. So by this time, Sam and Lexi are in the youth group. And I remember Randy called me and we had, or the church just had found out that his ex-wife passed away. So we were kind of helping their family with all of that and, and being supportive with that. But I remember he called me and said, 
Hey, I need you to consider something. And, and Randy is one of those guys. <laughs> it's so funny. Cause if anyone at our church that knew him, he was just very direct. He was a businessman. He was extremely intelligent, funny personality, but just very direct and very, um, just got to the point. So he said, Hey, I want you to consider this and pray about it. But would you consider being legal guardian of my children? If anything happens to me? And I'm like, uh, <laughs> that's a big Randy. question. Um, it was literally, that was the first thing he said on the phone call, you know, it's just <laughs> right to the point. I said, okay, well, I need to think about this. He's like, okay, well, get back to me as soon as you can. <laughs> um, sure. and I said, okay. And yeah, I was like, okay. <laughs> so I was joking with him through that kind of the next few days. I said, listen, I don't have a problem doing that. I've never met anyone that ever had to take legal guardianship of anybody because of one or both parents, you know, something happening to them. So I never met anyone. I never, I've heard, you know, so-and-so who knows so-and-so who knows so-and-so, but not a direct, yeah. you know, personal kind of effect on me. So I thought, what are the chances? This guy is extremely healthy. His children are, you know, junior high and high school. This is fine. There's no big deal. I said, of course, you know, I prayed about it, but I, I really didn't have to think too long. So I remember having that conversation. I called him back a, a couple of days ago. I said, yeah, hey, put me down. He was updating his will. Uh, he's like, I'm, this is just for precaution. You know, I'm not sick. There's nothing happening. He was super healthy, living a great life. And I made a joke. I said, listen, man, you can't go on any missions trip. That is extremely dangerous. You know, we made these, like, I just kept making these jokes. I'm like, no bungee, you know, cord diving, no <laughs> skydiving, no rock climbing. You know, I was just making all these jokes. and. Um, so he put me down in his will. Sam and Lexi knew, and they had talked as a family, and they said, oh, yeah, that would be great to have Des in our life in that way. And their kids, all four of us, were not thinking anything was going to happen. But would you say you were close to them at that point? Yeah. I yeah. mean, I was okay. pretty – I was pretty um, – I was close to the kids. I, uh, because their, their extended family all lived very far, and they didn't have anyone immediate – within the area to help out with things and, and be a part of their life. They had family that would fly in regularly to be a part of, you know, Sam's Boy Scout trips or help with Lexi's birthdays or that kind of thing. But I also was one of those people because of my life. I didn't have a family of my own. I was single and I was always trying to do things with kids and families and be a part of their life. He oftentimes would say, hey, would you mind coming over and helping the other adults for Sam's birthday party or help, you know, go to Lexi's um, ice skating competition or, you know, just stuff like that. And I was always just super, super excited to be a part of their life in that way and just was able to kind of be a part of their family. And so, you know, when he asked me that, I said, sure, not thinking anything. So you kind of fast forward a little bit more, uh, probably about three years, and we get to around 2014 and uh, Randy had heart problems. And by this time, Lexi is going into her senior year of high school and Sam is going into his freshman year of high school. And it's the three of them in their house. And, um, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of details that um, I can share about what I went through that I wouldn't ever want to speak on Sam or Lexi's behalf because sure. that was their, their time of, I'm sure they have their own just memories and their personal feelings and things that they went through. But during that time, it was, it was rough. It was, here's a single dad and, and two high school kids. Our church was a very, very huge help. And Randy leaned on a lot of neighbors and a lot of uh, people within our church and moms and dads coming in to try to help. But it, did, it got to the point where I actually would, would stay in their home to try to help with things of just giving care to the family. And do you know at this point, like this does not look good. Yes. I think that I'm up. Yes. Yes. So there was a point where, you know, he was ill, he was sick, trying to figure th some things out, um, going to doctor's appointments early on. And then it kind of, as it progressed, I mean, it was clear that he was very, very ill. And it got to the point where in probably January, February of 2014, it got to the point where his, his, he mentally was all there, but physically his body wasn't able to keep up. So he had a nurse 
that would come in every day to give him meds. And he was a stubborn guy, man. We would, I would, <laughs> we would laugh and I say, Randy, you are so stubborn. He's like, no, I don't need help. I don't need to, you know, go somewhere to, to take care of me. I said, you have two kids here. You know, they can't, they're in high school. They're literally going to school. And, and so, um, we just had people coming in from, from our church providing meals. I actually would, there were times where I actually drove, I personally drove him to the Cleveland clinic for two or three days and wow. he would pay for the hotel room. I would get a room across the hall from him in case something happened, but I mean, he couldn't drive himself. He was to this point in a wheelchair, you know, had to lay in bed all day or lay on the couch all day. The kids would have to bring him food and it was a lot. It was a lot. And it was, yes, yeah. um, it was a lot. And so in March, early, early in March, it was March around March 1st or so of 2014. It was getting to the point where everyone, it was crystal clear plans need to be made. What's going to happen for his care? Cause everyone assumed, man, this is going to be a long year of his disease and health to kind of take the process. And so met with, you know, his doctor was coming in saying you have six months to a year type of thing, making plans for that, letting that probably soak in for Sam and Lexi. And I remember talking to him one night, I was at their house. I went over just to kind of hang out and I brought food. I was, I think I went over to try to do some laundry for them and clean up a little bit. And I remember Randy at this point, it was super late at night and I was getting ready to leave and Sam and Lexi had already went to bed. It was a school night. And so I was just making sure Randy was good. He was, he was at this point laying on the couch and kind of lived in the living room. So I was like, you know, let's get your water, make sure your phone's charged in case you need something. Um, just down the street, you can call me. I was living in an apartment with, um, one of my college roommates, old college roommates. So I said, I'm just down the street if you need anything. And then God gave us just probably about an hour of just heart to heart conversation. And Randy said, you do know that I will not be coming back from this. Like I will die from this heart disease. And we had this big heart to heart conversation. He said, three years ago, I asked you to be legal guardian of my children. And I said, yeah. (laughs) And he said, I want you to know that that is still our wishes, meaning his, Sam and Lexi's wishes, but we will not think anything different of you. There will be no hard feelings. There will be no bitterness. We would not judge you if you decide that this is something you can't do because it's now reality. It isn't just this funny conversation. It isn't just, Hey, don't go skydiving. Don't let anything happen to you. I mean, this was a, this was, he was coming down to the last days of his life. And I said, you know what, Randy, I appreciate that. He said, I understand you're a single woman. You want to have a family of your own someday. This is a lot for you to take in. He said, I would not think anything less of you if you said no. So I sat there and it was almost immediate that I felt God saying, you have to be obedient to this and you have to say yes. You're not saying yes to Randy. You're not saying yes to Sam and Lexi necessarily, but you're saying yes to me. And I... I just knew. I remember sitting there and I thought, Randy, I, I can't say no. I said, I honestly want to, and all of my humanness, I'm like, this is not anything that I've ever dreamt for my life, being a single woman and taking on two high school kids after losing their mom three years prior, being a part of literally seeing their dad's life just ripped out of his body. And I, we were kind of sitting in the dark and I, I, I said, I can't say no. He said, are you sure? I said, yes. And I'm said, I'm not saying yes to you. I'm saying yes to the Lord. He said, okay. And so the next day on March 2nd, I remember this so clearly because it was, I mean, it happened so fast. I, I woke up and I went to work and I had talked to my roommate. Her name's Aaron. Talked to my roommate when I got home that night after having that big heart to heart with Randy. I said, Aaron, I think I'm going to have to move in with Randy and Sam and Lexi. There's no way that they could take care of their dad while going to school and being a part of everything else in their life. Their friends, you know, just doing all the things that yeah, a sixteen year old right. and an eight year old should be doing, you know. So I had um the next day I, I went back to their house and I talked to Randy and Sam and Lexi and I said, Listen, you guys, 
I'm not trying to barge in. You can say no to me, but I really feel like I need to move in with you guys and help take care of your dad. I mean, he is not getting better. And he didn't want to have hospice. He just was so stubborn. I'm like, Brandy, you're so stubborn. <laughs> we would joke in the middle of it, which I think is a beautiful thing about, about all of it is that you can still, you know, laugh and joke. And that's the kind of relationship I had with their family. I said, you're so stubborn. I said, if you won't have any full-time care for yourself, let me move in. You have to have somebody here. You can't put this pressure on your children. They've already are going through enough of losing their dad and watching him be ill and sick. You have to let me move in. So that's when I really thought, oh Lord, this is going to be the longest year of my life, of their life, of everything. So he agreed. He said, okay, fine. I'll, uh, you can move in. They, they um, have a beautiful home. Like I said, he was um, just a super intelligent, worked super hard, always provided well for his family. God blessed him tremendously with just the finances that they need and all that stuff. So I said, I'll move into the upstairs guest bedroom and I will just, you have to have help. So he said reluctantly, he's like, okay, I, I, we'll compromise. You can move in and help take care of, of things. And I really think that when I moved in on March 2nd, I just kind of slowly started moving stuff in that it was, I don't know if it was just an ease of his mind or a combination of just knowing that his kids would be okay. But he passed away like four days later. Wow. And, and, I, and I'm wondering if it was some sort of like release of my kids will be okay. Yeah. Someone is here. here. Yeah. I'll be taken care of. Yeah. And there's, there's so, as I'm talking about this, I haven't spoken this in a long time. It's been, it's been a little bit, but there are little bits and pieces. Like I said before, you look back and you see all of these details unfold when you're living in the middle of it. It's just chaos and heartache and emotion and just a whirlwind of anger, frustration, sadness, um, grief, all of that stuff. But there were so many things that lined up that God had lined up up to the day that he passed away that, I mean, there is literally no credit that can be given than to what God had, had did and what he prepared everyone for. And so it was, it was, that was one of the most interesting starts of that journey was that week of all of that. And at the time my roommate, Erin, she had left on a business trip for that week, that Monday through Friday. And it was funny because when she left, I was fully living in our apartment. By the time she came back that Friday, I had moved out, was living with the kids and Randy had passed away. What a week. Like, yeah, instant, just life completely changed for everybody. And so that was a journey of about three and a half years. I lived in their home. You know, like I said, there wasn't the stress of any financial burden or, wondering of how the kids would be taken care of, um, how I would be able to, to support them financially. Like I said, their dad was just blessed and super smart with finances and had a great business and left plenty of money to help care for them, for food, for college, for weddings, for master's degrees, for, <laughs> you know, all of that stuff. It was a huge blessing that we never had to deal with any of that, just wondering of how it would be taken care of financially. And, um, had great people lined up in our lives of two trustees that were fully in charge of all the financial part. So I didn't have to have that, that stress. Cause I'm like, I don't, it's such a unique situation of, you know, right. And you have your own with, you know, (laughs) raising children when this is something you have planned on. The entire neighborhood that they lived in at the time was just super supportive. All of their Sam's and Lexi's friends, parents just came out of the woodworks and, you know, we're texting and calling and bringing food. Our church family was tremendous. Um, my family who were in California, I mean, my parents flew out a lot and my brothers, you know, came to visit and, um, FaceTime thankfully, and all this technology of, you know, uh, extended family of both of the kids would come in. And so, I mean, it was just a crazy, crazy three and a half years of all of that. And so people will say, you know, I've had, especially moms would say, wow, what, 
what an amazing thing you did. That is so beautiful. That is so wonderful. You know, and, and yes, those are, it was amazing, beautiful, wonderful, but it was the most, for me personally, it was the most loneliest time I think I'd ever lived in my adult life. Scary. Yeah run to someone and say, Hey, what did you do when this happened to you? Yes, yes. <laughs> there was no one else that that's there wasn't. your situation. I, mean, I was constantly calling my mom because I don't know. I'm like, I don't know how to raise children. <laughs> yeah, and they're experiencing the grief of their father's death. Yes. yes. So it's not even like you're just moving in to take care of them. There's a exactly. whole other element. Exactly. And you're a mom and you know, and you, you know, just all of those every single thing. I just, I had no idea. And I legitimately, this is so funny because I remember thinking, and I told the kids this once and and after times have passed and, you know, we can, we've talked about different things here and there, but I remember thinking that first week, uh, sorry, week two after, after their dad passed away, I literally was thinking, oh my goodness, this is going to be the most fun time. It's going to be like camp, like kids camp or like a way extended vacation Bible school or, you know, because I've always been their children's pastor. So they're just going to see me as like, oh, this is so cool. Desiree's going to be like a slumber party every night. And I legitimately thought they would be so thankful for me coming into their life to save the day. I mean, I just thought I just had that naive, this is going to be easy. I've known them since they were kids. Yeah, it, it, it was not. <laughs> So what did that look like? It was, it was, it was hard. It was, um, I immediately went in to, uh, got a counselor, Christian counseling because I needed that support. Yeah. I was scared a lot, not knowing what to do. It was different because Lexi was, had always been the woman of the house. Mm. And so she, I remember in junior high and high school, I remember sitting with her and she's like, Hey, I need to come up with some meals for my dad and brother. Um, can you give me some, some recipes for like the crock pot or how do you go grocery shopping? Or, you know, I, I got to pack lunch for Sam. I got to, I do laundry and you know, all of this stuff, what kind of cleaning supplies you use? So she was the woman of the house. And then here comes myself into this house that just kind of disrupts everything she's ever known as being kind of the woman of the household, also going with the grief of her dad being gone and being a senior in high school and getting ready for college and all that stuff. So, I mean, it was, we kind of just walked on eggshells a little bit with one another, trying to figure out this dance of how do we live together? How does this work? I thought, do I cook meals for them every day? I don't know what their, their meal traditions were. Do they sit down at the table? I mean, it just was so interesting. I only knew how I grew up. So I only knew how to do things the way that I was raised, which was different than the way that they were raised. And you know, I didn't your house know. and your kids. Exactly. would have been done. It's exactly right. So, I mean, I remember even learning I remember I picked up the wrong spaghetti brand. We use this brand. I'm like, okay. So I was literally taking notes on my phone. I mean, I had a notebook writing down things of like, okay, this is what he likes. This is what she likes. This is, we don't put the silverware in this drawer. I mean, it just was, it rocked my world and it rocked their world too. Did there come a point when you did get on the same page where things did move smoothly? I think, yes, it was probably, um, I mean, it was a while, I would say close to eight months to a year of, we got kind of a rhythm. Okay. But also in that time period of eight months to a year, I went from Desiree, the children's pastor, Hey, I'm going to pick you up and take you out for ice cream to Sam, you need to take out the trash. Lexi, what time are you going to be home? Who are you going with? Text me when you're, you know, and so trying to figure out, okay, now I'm disciplining and trying to train them and help prepare them for for life and all of that stuff. You are no longer the fun youth pastor. Exactly. And that I probably that was probably the most difficult part of our relationship besides the fact of living together, it was that our whole identity of who we were in relationship to one another completely changed instantly and we didn't know how we were supposed to do that. We didn't know how to even maneuver even the conversation of acknowledging that all of that changed 
And so it was super difficult and super hard, but you know, through counseling and through just the wisdom, I would call my mom all the time, mom, how do I do this? You know, how do I, how do I, did I do this correctly? Was this a good response? Or I would ask other moms in our church, you know, you raise teens. Like, is this a normal thing? How they respond. And I know I ask those questions of other moms who have, you know, girls just a little farther ahead than my sure. girls. Yes. You know, and I know that that's difficult for me when they're my own kids. Right. So. Yes. Yes. It was a lot of praying. It was a lot of, <laughs> a lot of just seeking wisdom from other people. So how did you transition then out of their house, Sam and Lexi, back into your own life? Yes. Yes. So, um, it was, it's interesting. All the, the whole other interesting dynamic is all of the things that I learned legally about the state of Ohio and how they do legal guardianship. But Sam turned 18 in January of his senior year of high school, probably three or four days later, because he was 18, I got my release papers from the court saying that you no longer have any legal, basically legal ties to Sam Demian because he was still in high school. So he still needed a guardian, you know, in the household with him and and Mm -hmm. that kind of thing. So I had to get him to graduation. So he graduates high school and I believe that was in 2017 and or 16, I forget, but it got to about the month of June and we were just in the kitchen and I was just kind of wondering like what was happening because he was on his own basically. I I mean I literally had to sign over everything. I had to name, had to go and sign everything over and say that I had no legal ties to Sam. And I had already done that with Lexi mm-hmm. prior. But um so I thought, okay, I wonder what the next steps are. There's no book for this, you know, there's no manual for what we're supposed to be doing. And it was their dad's wishes before he had passed away that I would have stayed in the house until Sam graduated college, just to at least have a home base for him and his sister to come back to. And I thought, you know what? I need to have that conversation with Sam because that was an arrangement that was made when he was in sixth grade, uh, or not sixth grade, going into high school. Mm -hmm. And I said, Hey Sam, you know, what are your thoughts on, on things? I know that, you know, you're legally on your own. What are your thoughts on what we do moving forward with me living here and he just said, he said, I'm, I'm very thankful for all that you've done for us, but I'm ready now to start my life. And, you know, I think it, I think it could be time for you to basically move out and you can continue your life. And I thought, oh my gosh, <laughs> this guy, this kid is 18 years old in this five-story home, <laughs> you know, with his sister who's finishing college and she's kind of in and out of the house. And I'm like, that's just, that's a lot. I can't imagine being 18 and having this home to yourself and responsibilities of all of that. And so Lexi and Sam and I had another kind of family meeting and I shared with Lexi, I said, your brother is wanting me to move out and he's ready to start this new phase of his life. And he said, you know, going into college, I would really like to have this be a part of, you know, just having my time here in the house and ready for you to just kind of move on with your life. And, and so it was difficult for Lexi and I, so we kind of, I think just girl to girl, we, we went through our ups and downs, but our friendship really grew over the time I lived with her. And we had, you know, some headbutting moments, just like any other type of um, mom figure and daughter figure would have, but we grew to become good friends. And so it was more difficult for us where it was a sad thing for us as far as our relationship. And I remember her saying, you're the only family that I have left. And so it's difficult, but I understand where Sam's coming from and I want to respect his wishes. And you're not going far. Exactly. I mean, I literally went around the corner, (laughs) (laughs) literally right around. I could see their house if we, kind of clear the trees from where I'm living now, their houses, I mean, just directly across the way. So I said, you know, I'm not leaving your life, you guys. It was more symbolic. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so it was within a week after that conversation that I, I packed up my stuff and within that week I had moved out. And are you feeling kind of relieved, free? You know, 
it, I was, yeah. it was, and I didn't know that I, I didn't know it'd feel like that. Like, again, I look back and I realize, wow, that was another part of the ride, but there was a little bit of grief too, because that became my new normal of living with them as unique and interesting as it was. That was my life for almost four years. That was their life for almost four years. Um, but when I moved out, there was this of release. There was a sense of, okay, now what does it look like to go back to being just a single woman again? Because I didn't realize how much space kids take up in your brain. Like I'm sure you think of your kids all the time. Are they okay? Are they are where they're supposed to be? Are they doing well? Are they having fun? There are so many things. Yes. And I didn't realize that just that weight of responsibility and wanting so much for them. So I will say in a sense, my brain was kind of like, (laughs) whoo, there's more space there. And not in a bad way of like good riddance, but just what it was before. I can think Um, for myself again. Yes. Yes. And I will say this, it was probably instantly our relationship changed back to a friendship. And there was that freedom of I wasn't checking in on them. Like, what time are you going to be home? Did you get this done? Did you drop this off? Did you, you know, like all of those things. Did you go take out the trash? Did you, you know, so there was a a sense, I think, of relief for all of us where our relationship changed back to Desiree, the friend, Desiree, the other adult in their life that checks in on them and and is their friend and, and kind of mentor type of thing. So I think there was a little bit of relief in that sense too for everybody. So you have a relationship with them now. It just looks a little different. It does. It does look a little different. Yep. I've, um, I've stayed pretty well connected with Lexi. She's out, she's done with college. And so we've actually met up and, you know, for coffee and dinner and different things and groups of friends. And, you know, it's funny cause she's, she is now, we're now on that friendship side of everything. And then Sam is, is, halfway through his college career and probably just like any, I've, I've heard other moms say just like any other kind of boy stage of life, like he's doing his thing. So I hear more about Sam through Lexi Yeah, and um, you know, we'll text every now and again and just check in and yeah, it's uh, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> can you look back now and be like, can you see what God had for you there? Yeah. A clear picture to you. Yes, it was. It was um, in a lot of different ways. I see God. I always have wanted a family with kids. And for four, almost four years, he answered that prayer in a completely different picture than I had ever imagined for myself, where it stretched me as an adult, leaning on him in ways that I didn't know I needed to, trying to be a mother parental figure to two teenagers at a most horrific time of their life and a time that they never dreamed of that they would have to go through. And then it real, I, I realized one huge important thing for me personally is I'm 40 now. And I just always assumed by the age of 40, I would have been married by now and had a family of my own. And that just hasn't happened yet. And so one of the things that I thought probably in my early thirties, I thought, you know what, I would really consider being a single mom and maybe adopting and having starting my family that way. After going through this portion of my life with the Demian family, it has become crystal clear to me, for me personally, the family unit is so special in the way that God designed it that I would have to have a, a partner in that. I would have to have a husband to do that. And I, I know now that being a single mom is anything that I could do and feel like I could give, not my best, because I would do my best, but I feel like I'd be missing that whole family dynamic that God created so beautifully, so intricately, needing a husband and a wife, two parents, raising children. And I'm not saying that that's wrong for people. I just know that that isn't what I would want for my life now, knowing what it's like to be kind of a single parent yeah. and doing all of that. Yeah. And so... Um, that was that was something that was interesting and eye opening of what he taught me specifically for my life, and I'm very thankful for that. So, and then just realizing too the beautiful part of being a part of a church family. I literally could not have done any of this without my small group, without people within my church, 
without, and, and regardless of me being on staff at a church and, and I know a lot of people in the, in the church and, but not having that support and not being a part of a community that really, I mean, came around and helped in so many ways of support for me, for Sam, for Lexi, for the three of us all together. That was something that I thought this is what life is about is being a part of something that's bigger than yourself. Not just for the difficult times, but just the everyday, everydayness of everything. So absolutely. Yeah. And they, yeah. they feel that way about you too, I'm sure. Yeah. They were yeah. involved you know. with you because of that. Right. Right. Family. Yeah. 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 And then I look now, you know, working with um, different families and blended families or different family dynamics or um, families that are, have gone through a divorce. I feel like God's given me a little bit more of a compassion and a different perspective working with families in the community or within our church that I didn't have prior to the three and a half, four years of what I went through with the Demians. And so it actually has helped me with my compassion for families, seeing the different roles of what a mom does and a dad and kids. And and he's used that to really open my perspective on how to just come alongside families in whatever journey that they're in and be a part of speaking truth and life and support and encouragement because of what I know I went through personally and how he's used that to, to open my eyes a little bit more in a different way. Yeah. And some of that can only come from experience. Exactly. I 100% agree with that. Yes. Yes. You mentioned that it was your desire at one point to get married and have Mm -hmm. a family. Is that, Mm -hmm. is that still a part of your, it sure is. (laughs) It sure is. I joke with people. I said, Hey, I'm taking applications. So (laughs) people, um, it is, it is something that I desire wholeheartedly as a single woman. I I've gone through like much, I'm sure other single women have in, in their times of singleness and being a single adult of, I went through a little bit of a grieving time of what's wrong with me. Why is he answering my prayers? What am I doing wrong? Uh, I'm doing this right. You know, so it's one of those, I've had those battles and conversations privately with God. I've talked with my mom openly about it. I've called her crying saying, why can't I find someone? What's wrong with me? You know, what's, what's the deal. And so thankfully just in my spiritual growth and my understanding of who I am in God and understanding of my relationship with him. He has brought me on the other side of my satisfaction, my fulfillment and being content in my singleness has increased so much that I actually find joy and find privilege in being single and all the beautiful things about being single. At the same time, my desire and my longing to be married and have a family has not gone away. But, but it, it's, it's super neat to see how my satisfaction and where I am and, and what God has me doing right now has increased without taking away that desire in my heart. And should that ever be answered in this life? You know, I don't know, but it's something that I'll always have and always desire and always long for, but it doesn't take away from the beautiful parts of being single and the joys that I have of being single and I think that's just with time and experience and probably a little bit of, of maturity and life experience of moving through all of that. And I love it. I mean, I truly love my life right now. I love it. I feel fulfilled. It's exciting. It's a blessing. And I just, I couldn't be happier with being single, but yet yeah, still want to be married at some day and have family. So yeah, I can that see, makes sense at all. Absolutely. I can see both sides. I love my life and love my family and mm-hmm. I'm glad that that's where I am, but I can also look at your life and think, oh, the freedom that you have yes. or the opportunity <laughs> and the mind space, right. like we talked about earlier. Yes, yes. You know, there's just <laughs> two completely different worlds, yet right. positive aspects of both of them. Right, exactly. When I was graduating college, I was kind of part of this big group of girls and some of us got married not too long after graduating. And then there was another side of the group that didn't. And I remember that group would kind of refer to the married people as the marrieds. Right, right. (laughs) (laughs) And there was just, there was just definitely a divide. How can women who are married, who have families, how can they make sure to include single friends and not let that divide get too big? Mm, 
That's a really, really good question because I have friends who do super well with that. And I don't know that they do that if it's just something that's just within them and it naturally comes out. And I'm sure there's parts of it that they're very intentional to be aware of, okay, our single friends. And I'll just use myself as an example. But one person that does that super well is our mutual friend, Kim, Mm -hmm. who I've known Long, I've been friends with Kim longer than we haven't. So we've kind of crossed over that. I'm like, girl, we're getting old. (laughs) We've been friends longer than we haven't been friends. But just being intentional with kind of those girls night out, uh, checking in and just talking about life that, you know, asking how my life is going and being a part of my life being single. But then at the same time, I mean, you have to, I tell single girls all the time, you can't live a life that is woe is me. And you can't, you can't put some sort of um, like this feeling of punishment on your friends who are married and who do have a family. And that is a blessing for them. And I really think it is just your perspective. And that's what God has taught me is what kind of perspective do we live out and are we seeing? And is it a selfish perspective? Is it a perspective of, I want to be a blessing to those around me. And I think my friends who are married and have families and are busy with juggling schedules with their children and and family things, the perspective that they have of just saying, you know what, we want you to be a part of our life. We want you to be a part of our family and not just to be the babysitter of like, Hey, we want to go out. Let's call the single girls. Let's see Desiree, Aaron and Amanda. They're all single. (laughs) Let's see if they can come babysit. But building a relationship with us and who we are and both sides knowing that you are literally at different stages of life. And that is okay. And that every stage of life has room for the other stage of life. And there's beauty in both sides. And so I just, I, I think it is perspective and that took me a while to get to. So I don't say that lightly. It's something that God has, has taught me and has opened my eyes to. I think that's, that's a huge part of it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Desiree, I like to ask my guests at the end of the show for their favorite five things. Sure. What are five things that you're loving right now? Okay. So it's so funny about the five things. I was thinking about that. And um, one of my favorite five things, I was just telling another girlfriend of mine at church, her and I are always complaining about, (laughs) this is so funny, but she's like, I need to get new underwear. I get wedgies all the time. No one likes that. I know what you mean, especially working with kids in children's ministry. You're like running around, you're jumping up and down. You're so I said, you need to try these Reebok seamless hipster underwear. And I actually found them at Sam's club and they have a package of them of five for like $12. So I thought, okay, I'm going to try them. And I'm always trying new underwear, new socks, new sports bras. Those are my things that until I find the thing that works well with my body, I'm like, I'll just try as many as I can. And then once you find it, you got to buy lots. Oh my goodness. So I went to town. <laughs> I went to town. I put it on my Christmas list. I went on Amazon and bought some. So now she's like sold on these reboxing this <laughs> hipster underwear. Nice. Um, love them. And what's nice is they don't, you know, kind of cut into your little side rolls or anything like that. And Sounds just- good to me. And they stay in place. And I'm like, if I can wear them on a Sunday morning, running around with kids and children's ministry, and they are perfectly fine, then I know I have a winner in underwear. (laughs) Excellent. That's one of my five. Another one is probably for about six months or so I've been using, and I don't know if I'm saying this correctly, but Monet Shampoo and Conditioner. It's M-O-N-A-T and fabulous. Love it. Fabulous. You can only get it through a, consult, a consultant. So it's not anything you just order online or okay, jump on That Amazon. was my next question. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. So my girlfriend Amanda turned me on to it. So she said, I'm going to try this Monet shampoo and conditioner. I said, All right, you try it. And then I'm going to watch your hair for, for a couple months just to see if it actually works, you know? And I was sold. I love it. Love it, love it, love it. So that's something to look into. What does it do that makes it so special? So I get really greasy hair and it just has helped with the shine. It helps with the healthiness of it. It's super soft. I don't know. It just is. It's awesome. I love it. Okay. That sounds really good. Yeah. Another thing is more on the, I guess these are all kind of personal things, but more on the just study side of things. 
I've been doing the chronological plan through the Bible app. I don't know if you've heard of that, but it's have, awesome. yeah. Oh, it's amazing with the, the Bible recap. Yep. Did, did you tell Kim about this or did Kim tell you? Kim told me about this. <laughs> I, so I've been telling a whole bunch of other ladies about it and they too have jumped on this bandwagon of the Bible recap. And so yeah. it's phenomenal. I'm doing it too. I love it. I love it. It's so encouraging. One, it's, it's quick, but it's meaningful, valuable. I find myself sticking on sometimes to one day where I feel like I get a lot out of it. So I'm like, I need to listen to that again or reread that yeah. and just kind of study that for a little bit. Um, but I, I'm loving that a lot. And that's been helpful with my just personal time, quiet time, devotion time. And that's been super meaningful for me. And then the last two kind of go hand in hand. So I've gone through probably the last three years a very focused, intentional, just changing my eating and just a, a healthy lifestyle. And so I'm really huge on, for the last three years, I've, I've done this where I'll do meal prepping for the week. And I actually have been a part of a couple of gyms now where I've been doing some personal training, which has been helpful for myself where I need that accountability. So those two things of, um, I actually joined the zone personal fitness in Powell has been amazing. And then just meal prepping for the week and getting all my meals ready for work. And it's so much easier to eat well, yes. when you have it ready to go. Yes. Yeah. Yes. You don't have to think about it. And then you don't, you know, I'll do my meal prepping on a Sunday night or, or Monday. Those are my go-tos. Yeah. I love that. I meal prep too. When I have time. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, I mean, so much healthier. My kids complain a little bit because the food right. is, you know, it just is. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Healthy, I get it. More grown up, but. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely easier for one person than it is for a family. So. <laughs> Probably so. Yes. <laughs> All right. Those are great, Desiree. Thank you for sharing. Yes. Thank you. I think I'm due for a new round of underwear. So I'm going to be Yes. You those. need to go check those out. <laughs> You'll love them. <laughs> For sure. Desiree, I just appreciate you coming on and sharing your story. It is really, really incredible. Uh, the different aspects of, you know, what God has asked you to do and then your obedience. Right. Uh, not easy things. No, not at all. I love that you can look back and see his hand in all of it. That just yeah. makes it so meaningful and worth it. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you for allowing me this time to share. It was very meaningful for me to be able to speak those words again that I haven't just, you know, shared in a while. And so it was, it was valuable for me. So thank you. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Desiree. I love how she talked about not being able to see something clearly when you're in the midst of it, but being able to look back and see how God worked out all of the details for good. I also loved it when she explained how with time and maturity, she's learned to be content being single while still having the longing and the desire to be married. There's such a beautiful lesson there. And it doesn't just have to do with singleness. You fill in the blank. We all long for something, right? That's such a beautiful message. Everything we talked about today can be found in the show notes for this episode on girlstalkinglife.com. Also be sure to find me on Instagram at girlstalkinglife. Okay, friends, I have one favor to ask you. This week, could you either take 60 seconds to rate and review Girls Talking Life on iTunes or take 60 seconds to tell a girlfriend about the show? And if they don't already listen to podcasts, please show them where to find it on their phone. I so appreciate you helping others find the show. Next time, I'm talking with Leslie Verner. Leslie's book, Invited, The Power of Hospitality in an Age of Loneliness, releases tomorrow, August 13th. Leslie will be sharing parts of her story with us and talking about how inviting someone or accepting an invitation can make all the difference. Friends, don't let the conversation stop when the show is over. Share your stories and start your conversations with the girls in your life. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for tuning in.